So we're already recording. So okay. it's just, this is just B roll, I guess. Yeah, it's All right. just BS. <laughs> BS roll. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I do during the day. All right. That's, that's right. <laughs> Hey everyone, we really hope you enjoy these podcasts. I'm sure you know that this is a labor of love for us, so we have a Patreon campaign to help generate the funds necessary for the show to continue. Patreon is like a mix of NPR plus Kickstarter. It's crowdfunding for supporting your favorite grassroots entertainment, but you also get some awesome stuff in return. We have different donation levels set up, so $1 a month gets you Patreon-only content, such as the raw interviews, including all the footage of outtakes and raw audio that takes place before and after the recording. For $3 a month, we send you a Bourbon Pursuit branded koozie, as well as some Bourbon Pursuit branded stickers that you can slap on your laptop, guitar case, car window, or wherever. For $5 a month, you get a Bourbon Pursuit t-shirt, as well as get put into a monthly drawing where we've given away books, swag from some of our guests, and even bottles of bourbon. At $10 a month, I'm going to ship you out a sample of bourbon from my own personal bar. So please, if you like the show, support us, and we're going to send you some cool stuff in return. Remember that even $1 goes a long way. Visit patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash bourbon pursuit. Welcome back to the episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast. Kenny and Ryan here today, and we're actually uh, recording this in my house because, uh, you know, we've, uh, you know, when we talk to a lot of people, you know, we usually go to the distillery or we do things over Google Hangouts, but, you know, we've had uh, quite a few authors on and authors, not ever always has, a, has an office to go to. And I'm actually very excited about today because we're going to be doing a different type of author and a different type of kind of story today. So Ryan, kind of talk about it. Yeah. And also we, we, don't have enough Patreon supporters to get us a studio, so we're uh, we're still in Kenny's house. No, I'm kidding. But uh, no, super excited today to uh, talk to James um, about his book. Um, I'm real. I'm just reading the back here briefly, and I, I think the story sounds fascinating. I'm interested to learn more about it because growing up in Nelson County, a lot of your family, I think what you're about to talk about deals with the prohibit, dealt with the prohibition mm-hmm. and stuff. So that's kind of been in my family's history from back in the day. So interested to talk to you about it and, and dig into it. So with that, let's go ahead and introduce our guest. So today we have James Marker. James is the author of a new novel that is just now coming out to market called The Angel Share. So James, welcome to the show. I'm happy to be here. So James, you know, before we kick in and start talking about the book, uh, kind of talk about maybe um, just your history with bourbon, right? Uh, I think that's one thing to always kind of get an idea of is where do you really, uh, you know, maybe where you got some of the inspiration? Uh, how did it affect you growing up? Was there a first bottle that you kind of found a factuation with? Kind of kind of give us some background. Well, I, I guess my history with bourbon, I, I kind of came to the bourbon scene rather late. Um, and... You know, actually, I really started liking bourbon when I was researching this book. And uh, I guess I wrote the first draft of this about four or five years ago or maybe three years ago. Um, And that's when I started touring the distilleries and then trying all the different bourbons from each of them. Um, And that, you know, you know, first I probably started with bourbon with Coke or, you know, some kind of cola. (laughs) Like we all do. Yeah. And then I, you know, you know, start having it on ice. And actually, I like to drink it drink it neat now as long as it's it's good um but uh really it was the just visiting the distilleries and the the number one thing you know going into to the aging houses and you know smelling the angel share and that's that's what inspired uh uh for me to write this book um so actually i thought of the title before i thought of the story Uh, i think it was the jim beam uh distillery that was the first one uh, i visited with my wife and some friends and uh, we went into the aging house and they explained to us what the angel share was. And I said right there, <laughs> that that's the name of my next book. I don't have a story, but the, <laughs> and then, and the then you'll hear the term angel share at every other distillery you go to. <laughs> right, it seems right. like each tour you go to, it's like the same thing over. Yes. And, over. and in, in each one of those tours that we would be in the group and they would say, does anybody know what this smell is? And I would raise my hand, angel share. <laughs> <laughs> um, so but let's, the, let's rewind a little bit. So like, whose idea was it to go on the bourbon trail? Like, was it you? Is it a birthday? Was it was it a, a, just a group of friends said we need to go. Mm-hmm. Um, so we went and yeah. I wanted to, once I went, I wanted to go to all of them. So talk about, are you a Kentucky native? Is it something that you had missed out on? Oh, yeah, I missed out on it. Uh, I grew up here in Louisville. I went to DeSales High School. I uh, went to UofL. Um, so 
Kentucky native, born and bred, and um, I don't think I hit my first distillery until, what am I now, 43? I was probably 39, 40. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, your I'm, late, I'm late kinda, to the bourbon scene. You kind of take it for granted, you know, yeah. it's right there. I know. That's what everybody, when my family comes into town, they're like, oh, what do you think of the Louisville Slugger Museum? I'm like, I don't know. I've been <laughs> right. never been there. <laughs> yeah, I've been there since I was in middle school. But so. the first bourbon I ever tried was Old Forester. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's the bourbon that's uh, featured prominently throughout the book just because it was one of the few bourbons to survive prohibition. So let's talk about the uniqueness of it, right? Because we've had we've had Fred Minnick on and Chuck Cowdery and all these people that are uh, maybe they wouldn't quote, you know, classify themselves as like Michael Veach as being a bourbon historian. Right. Uh, but, you know, they're they're fact tellers um, and they try to make not a really novelist. It's yeah. Kinda... And they, they try to make a story out of some of the facts. Uh, however, you kind of took uh, an approach where this is uh, purely uh, pretty much fictional, right? Right. So and kind of talk about that. Well, you know, I wanted to be his, as historically accurate as possible. Um, but that, that's the one good thing I, I can, you know, if I did miss something, I could always say, oh, it's fiction. Yeah. <laughs> it's well, well most, of the, most of the stories are fiction anyways. Right. In well, history, they, you know so. what? That, that's what I found out. Um, you know, you, you listen to all these stories and they started, you know, way back in the 18 whatevers. And. And I always wonder, you know, how much of this is true? It's like playing a game of telephone, you know, <laughs> right. time it gets to the 10th person. You yeah. Know. And, you know, my distillery in the book is, uh, it's called the Old Sam McPhee Distillery in uh, Twisted Tree, Kentucky. Um, and, it, you know, I just kind of had to imagine what it would have been like back then. Um, and at the same ki- time, ki- you know, I would, you know, weave in what the feel of current distilleries, you know, what they're like now, just to give you a little bit of sense of both. Well, kind of talk about some of the, the background of the book itself. Like, how does the story start out and, you know, where does it take place? And kind of go a little bit more in depth with that. Okay, well, the story takes place in 1934, just after the re- repeal of uh, Prohibition, um, in a fictional town called Twisted Tree, Kentucky. Um, uh, on the distillery, there's two trees that grew up side by side and ended up twisting into one another to form one tree and that's why the where the town got its name um but it's a year after uh, prohibition was repealed uh the family the mcphee family still lives on the distillery even though it's been shut down you know since 1920 um and they're kind of reeling from the the death of their youngest son henry who uh was four year old four years old and died in a car accident uh where the father barley was driving um, so Barley has basically spent the, the past year since his death sitting in his new Lazy Boy because it just came out about that time and drinking Old Forester and, and looking out his window at the neighboring Potter's Field, which is where they would bury most of the uh, homeless. Um, but uh, m- usually the, the burials went unattended. You know, nobody would ever show up to them. Um, but on the year anniversary of the son's death, there's a homeless man buried in the potter's field whose name is uh, Asher Keating. And that night, there's about three to 400 homeless people come pay the respects, um, which, you know, gets Barley um, and his son, William, who's 18 and a, a budding reporter, you know, out of the house to figure out who this guy was. Um, and it turns out that, the, that Asher was a homeless man who um, some people thought was Jesus. Um, he, he helped, you know, feed the other homeless. He helped clothe them. Um, he would do it by stealing. Um, a little bit of Robin Hood, I guess. Right. You and he, uh, you know, some people say he performed miracles. Um, some people say he was more of a magician. Um, some thought he was crazy. Some, you know, the, I never really answer what exactly Asher Keating was other than he was kind. You know, he was kind to people. Um, but this, this gets the father out of his funk, um, and the son, um, investigating, you know, more about Asher Keating's life. Um, so what happens is, uh, William, the, the oldest son and the, uh, main character of the book, uh, he ends up going to the Courier Journal and, um, publishing, they, they buy his first story and it's breaking news and it's called, uh, the Potter's Field Christ. Um, but because of the you know, the times, it's during the Great Depression, people are looking for answers. Uh, people from all over start flocking to the woods and Twisted Tree wanting to visit Asher, Asher's grave. 
um, because recently the McPhee's daughter had, I'm not, I won't give it away, but a minor mir miracle <laughs> okay. of her own. Um, so people flock to the woods at, around the distillery and uh, they want to visit the grave and it, it, it brings life back to the town. Um, but even better, it brings life back to the distillery. So they start, you know, filling the barrels again, loading up the aging house with uh, bourbon. And uh, uh, but the problem is the father was also a bootlegger uh, and gangster during the 1920s under a different name. And now that the son has published this article and brought attention to the distillery, the gangsters know where he is. Oh, um, yeah. Okay. So along with bringing life Al back Capone's to the town, way. Oh, yeah, we talk about how and uh, George Remus up in Cincinnati, and so it brings uh, danger back to Twisted Tree, along with uh, um, you know lot, the life it brings to it. So the, the the gangster in my book, the main one, his name is Tommy the Bat Barducci. That's um, awesome. He. Uh, walks around with a little slugger <laughs> ah, that's real cool it's, yeah, I it like, is cool it, it is kind of interesting because after prohibition you know a lot of there's a lot of small family distilleries probably that you know just didn't recover mm -hmm. and um you know you see we have that poster we got from barton's of all the distilleries that have been in kentucky and you're like looking at all these right. names and you know who didn't survive so right. I, that seems like an interesting story just to kind of I, I like where it's going i think you know with the prohibition the families distillery is making a recovery and how right. that process went also with the homeless guy i think gives a little another yeah and uh, you know it. the whole issue with um you know when you start filling up the barrels again you can't sell it right you know right. you, you got to let it age um but there's a little twist in there um that has something to do with uh old sam the person who founded it um who he actually you know killed himself the day prohibition started and the feds came in and took his distillery um, there's a little twist in there at the end with uh, something he did oh, okay. okay so cool. you know we'll not, we won't get that away so <laughs> i guess more about like just the the distillery that was at the at the home i mean so it went it went defunct at at prohibition and right. then from there was it was it just the um uh the potter's christ that that kind of really was the inspiration of of the characters truly starting the the, the, the distillery back thinking that either it's a mechanism for um financial reasons right. or is it just for you know well, making the town budding again whatever it the, is the son uh william he you know he he's he's tried his hand at being a reporter and up until now he's never been successful the couriers always turned down his articles um but deep down his passion was always to be the next master distiller of old sam um and you know, he'd been on his father for the whole past year of starting it again. And, you know, he just didn't want to do it. So it was, you know, he, he was kind of pushing that along. Um, and actually, you know, once the people started coming, he just decided that he was going to do it on his own. Um, he and the wife, uh, or his, he and his mother. Um, and once they started doing it, that's what got Barley you know, he said, well, I don't know if they're going to do it right. So I'm going to jump in there and I'm going to, you know, go ahead and get this thing started again. Um, cause Barley, the, the reason he became a bootlegger is, you know, he watched all his, his father's old Sam, uh, bourbon get taken, um, and kind of get, you know, siphoned out of the collection houses and sold elsewhere. And he said, if somebody's going to sell my father's bourbon, it's going to be me, even if it was illegal. <laughs> yeah. So I guess that's a really, really interesting tale about how you, you brought in the bootlegging because that was actually a, you know, you said you mixed in a lot of pieces of history into this because as, as a lot of people do know that prohibition was a time when, uh, during the 1920s when, yeah, George Remus, Al Capone was, mm -hmm. were very prominent people. Right. Uh, even here in Louisville, uh, you can go and you can stay downtown and you can go visit the yeah, Rat the Seal Box. Right. And just at the Seal Box and you can, you can w listen to all those stories. Uh, and the, they still have the old Forester prohibition at the Fraser Museum, they might still. I don't okay. remember, but I mean, it's it's. Uh, but I mean, it, it's it's interesting how you how you did all that. It was the idea of 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 having the the, the gangster twist into it, just a, as you said, a way to bring some more suspense and thriller kind of pieces into it. For sure, um, and I, I love the time period, the the nineteen twenties. Um, uh, I think I watched a lot of uh, Boardwalk Empire and Peaky Blinders mm -hmm. while I was pregnant. Um, but I, I, I'm just a big fan of the whole 
you know, prohibition, roaring twenties, the gangsters. And, uh, and I, I, I like to put gangsters in any book that I can. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it was pretty easy to come up with the name Barley, right? Because right. it's just, you know, right. So kind of talk about any other inspirations for characters or anything like that. Um, I don't know. I, I guess, you know, books kind of come in, in pieces. And, um, I think the, the first thing I wanted to do, you know, I had the title first, I called it the angel share. And then, um, I knew I wanted to do historical. Um, and so I just imagined, uh, the distillery first and that's when the name barley came to me. And, um, I think at the time I was reading an article on, I think it was somebody from St. X who did a, a documentary on about a potter's field. Um, so that kind of clicked in and I thought, you know, okay, I'm going to, I'll have a potter's field right next to the distillery. And, um, and from that, it just kind of grows and you add layers, layers to it. And each, each rewrite, you add more and, you know, I don't even know where some of the names come from. It's just, <laughs> just from thin air. Right. Is it typical to come up with a title first? I don't know. I, the only, I only know what I do. <laughs> um, so it, it's not typical. It's, I guess not typical for me. That's the only book that I've done where I have the title first. Mm -hmm. Um, usually I'll have either a character first or the, you know, the premise and, and some of the, the plot. Um, but that, that's the first one that I've done where I had the title first. So about how long did it take you to research and put this thing together? Um, I think I researched probably for two months. Um, that was the fun part, though. Or less. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, <laughs> the research was visiting the bourbon distilleries right. and, and uh, read, reading books on it. And um, But I'm more, I, I get too impatient. I, some people can research for months before they write a book. I can't do that. I have to, I have to write. I have to start the story. So what I do is I'll research a lot as I go along. Um, so, I'll, you know, I might write myself to a, a certain point and you know, like his Barley's lazy boy chair. And, you know, I, I say, okay, was, was that even there back then? <laughs> and so I researched that and you say, yes, it was. So I'll put that in there and move on. Um, so I do a lot of researching, um, as I go. Was there any particular distilleries, like I guess history or story that might've inspired you to, you know, to come up with the, the, the distillery that, um, that I visited that I, I think, envisioned the most for this was the uh woodford woodford okay yeah um probably my f one That's of my favorite tours was uh the buffalo trace uh, i think what was neat about that is i went there one one day with my friend and we were just walking around and this barrel just rolls out <laughs> right in the middle of nowhere rolls you know across the run into another building and i thought that was pretty neat seeing that in action um, plus, uh, the second time I went there on the tour, we were, and our, our guide said, all right, I want y'all to all look over there in the corner. That's a, that's a barrel of Pappy right there. <laughs> and, uh, they had to keep us away from it. I was going to say, were you yeah. a Freddy by any yeah. chance? <laughs> so I guess the, uh, the one thing that we always love is we love Woodford. Uh, the, the distillery in itself yeah. is just so iconic. Oh, as, yeah. as Quintessential as, Kentucky. It, yes. I agree. Yeah. As, as, as you're, as you're driving up to it, you see the rolling fields, you mm -hmm. see the horse farms and, and not only that as, uh, it's a very clean, uh, operation where right. everything is, uh, kind of always where you expect it to be. So mm -hmm. kind of talk about, um, you know, some more, some more inspirations from the distillery and like how that mapped into the, into the, the book or the story as well. Is it anything that goes into the process of the making bourbon that was, that was into it or anything like that? Uh, well, you know, just at each distillery, you know, seeing the, you know, seeing it f ferment and bubble and the big vats and you go in there and you smell the corn. And, um, so I wanted to make sure, um, when I wrote the book that I really, really gave it a, sense of, uh, smell, um, and, you know, where you could really picture what everything looked like. And, um, more than anything that inspired me, uh, and a lot of times I'll, when I'm thinking of a story, I'll think of what it would be like as a movie. Um, and that when I did go to Woodford, you know, I, uh, you know, I saw the campus there and leading up to it and I thought, okay, if, if this is ever a movie, this is where I want it, want it filmed. They're just <laughs> maybe, no guests for a couple of weeks and just shoot it. <laughs> um, 
but to me that was a, you know like you said that was an iconic place to go um that you know i just tried to be as authentic as possible with with the entire you know process of making the bourbon so talk about some more uh i guess we haven't touched into more like any any your other publications or other things that you've done uh mm-hmm. so people kind of just know more about you as an author right um well i've been writing for about 15 years um I've written about 10 books. Um, the, the last book, uh, white wind blue, it came out in 2013. Um, that was the first book to go out, you know, across the country. And, um, that one takes place in 1929 at Waverly Hills. Um, you do have a fascination with the twenties there, don't you? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I, I like the time period and, uh, not, not everything I write is going to actually my next book is set in 1920 uh, <laughs> but not everything i write will be, be what, right, what is right it about the period. 20s you like so much like i said i think it's the prohibition and roaring 20s and gangsters and i don't know I just, <laughs> bootlegging, and bootlegging in general yeah, yeah. Um, See, now the only thing we bootleg are like movies right? exactly <laughs> right yeah. exactly <laughs> Yeah, de- like the, the DirecTV boxes or whatever. Uh, yeah, that was, well, that wasn't like the early 2000s. Yeah. You hacked, hacked DirecTV boxes. But the, the Waverly book, uh, White Wind Blue, I mean, it's I'm still doing book clubs. You know, three years later, I'm still doing book clubs locally of people uh, really get into that book. Um, the, you know, that, that one's about a doctor there at, uh, at Waverly who, you know, they don't have a cure for TB, so he, he tries to heal people um, by playing music. Uh, so he'll walk around bedside with a violin and play and and ultimately ends up forming an orchestra <laughs> at, at the sanitarium um so but that you know that was my first one to go out i have yet to go there i'm too scared <laughs> I, i've only been there once uh you know i was there for a couple hours researching and uh, it's, it's it's a fascinating so, place yeah tell our listeners about waverly hills just in case because they could visit it i guess if they oh yeah okay they, if, if they're into spooks if you pay them <laughs> you can go <laughs> yeah and um, i guess halloween season is actually the oh, when, yeah. it, when it really well, that's the biggest up. one because they have they have their haunted house and um they they pretty much do tours i think for the whole year and they and they stay packed it's it's hard to get in um but that you know initially when i went there to visit i was wanting to write something a scary novel um but once i got there uh you know i was just kind of taken in by the history of the place and the architecture and thought that uh you know something needed to be written kind of honor honor the people who lived and died there and worked there as opposed to what it's known for now which is mostly supernatural Mm -hmm. type stuff so I want to get back to the to the actual book and why you're here today. So kind of talk about um, more about like what this what this book really means to you in regards of bringing maybe the one of the first I mean the first that I know of of a, yeah. a fictional story uh, you know that kind of brings in a lot of the history of the bourbon industry in itself. Uh, it's nothing that I I didn't go into it thinking you know, that you're think, a revelation or something right <laughs> um, but I'm slowly realizing that it is yeah um, I didn't even look into it to see if there was if it was the first bourbon novel um but it might be uh but uh i mean it's pretty neat Mm -hmm. uh, because you know i'm getting getting a lot of attention from you know whiskey and bourbon writers and um i knew it would do pretty well locally just because of what it is but uh, i'm I'm anxious to see what kind of life it takes on as as it you know as the word gets out so how's the bourbon community? Are they how are they embracing this? How, like you and Fred make boys now, or are they like, damn it, we should have thought of that? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it's pretty neat because I, you know, I, my publicist at the uh, at my publisher, she's handling all the media, um, and I, I said, well, I'll help out too, and um, I, I'm going to start contacting, you know, bourbon bloggers, whiskey bloggers. Uh, sending out press releases and it's funny how it seems like they're all connected mm-hmm. <laughs> somehow because uh, uh i mean i've heard from um whiskey bloggers i've heard from three in ireland uh two in scotland about four from england and they're all asking for the book um like i got up this morning and there's a blogger from scotland asked for the copy of the book cover so he can put it out on his social media um it's pretty neat yeah, you were telling about that that story uh, about their Instagram account where they take bottles yes. of whiskey. Yeah, there's another one. It's called uh, Whiskey with a View, 
uh, on Instagram, they have 57,000 followers and they basically, it looks like they take, uh, um, different bottles of bourbon and they set it out in nature. I mean, a beautiful, uh, scenery behind the bottles, you know, really nice pictures. Um, but they, <laughs> they said that they wanted to do a, uh, photo shoot with the book. <laughs> so I'm going to make sure I get them a a copy of the book and see what nice clean copy yeah, not, yeah nice <laughs> nice clean copy i don't want any provocative poses yeah <laughs> well i think it's very interesting because it, it also takes almost because you know you said you know ryan hinted at you know fred minnick and all these people they're authors but i also think it takes a, a different kind of author right a different kind of imagination to be able to mm-hmm. put together a story like this right? right and i think that's the main thing is even though it is a a bourbon whiskey themed novel um and the cover I think the cover really pops. Um, that can't be the story. Um, so I, I think the story revolves around and has a lot to do. You know, every thread in the story might weave through the bourbon aspect and the distillery parts, but it has to be the. It, I, I didn't think it could be the main main story, and the the characters would have to take care of that. Uh, but I think that you know I blended the two to together as best i could yeah there's only uh, so much you can talk about the the process of making bourbon <laughs> exactly right. it's 51 percent corn and, <laughs> right uh, and you know and I, and I do get into that but if i think if i tried to write a novel about that you know i might get pe- some people to buy it but how many people would say this is good <laughs> yeah <laughs> right exactly yeah i'm always fascinated by writers because I've wanted to be a writer, but I can't even daily journal. And so <laughs> like, talk about your writing process. Cause I, I, a few authors I admire, I, I'm, I'd love digging into their process. What, how is yours? Well, mine's kind of all over the place. I, I definitely don't outline. Um, I know a lot of authors outline. I can't do it. Um, to me, I don't have the patience to sit down and outline a book. And I also, I don't really know exactly where I want to go with it. Um, and I found that if, when I try to outline, you, it sometimes some parts become too contrived because you're trying to get to that next point on the outline instead of just kind of letting it go. Um, so what I do is I, you know, I take notes. Um, you know, if, if I th- I'll think of a line of dialogue um, that might happen three quarters of the way through the book and I'll write it down and or i might think of a scene that i want to happen here i'll just write it down and that they're all in a big stack and i or you know scattered on a piece of paper and it looks like a mess but i know where (laughs) everything is Um, and generally i'll finish a chapter and um write what i want to happen in the next one or two and then go that you know maybe a mini outline and and go from there um but i'm a fast writer uh you know i wrote the first draft of the angel share in three months. Oh, wow. Um, and then I spent another nine months rewriting it about five times. Um, but it, you know, I, I could, in my, my new book coming out in next January, I wrote that in five months. Um, so I'm, I, I could probably write two books a year. Wow. That's, that's awesome. impressive. Yeah. So I guess what is, what is this book really taught you, you know, you kind of talked about the community in general, but what does this book kind of taught you about, about bourbon, you know, and, and is this something that, that, you know, you're growing more of a factuation with just in bourbon in general, just because of it? Yes. You just look on top of my refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I like, you know, I was more of a, I guess more of a beard drinker and, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. No, but <laughs> what, but once I started doing my so-called finger quotes here uh, research, <laughs> uh, visiting the distilleries and getting you know getting a bottle from each one, uh, it, it's not just the you know I, I like the taste of most of it, um, but to me it was something about the, the the bottles. I mean how neat some of the bottles are and just the color of the bourbon inside of it. Um, you know, I like, I like all of it. It's, it's, you know, kind of fascinating to me. Yeah. It's like a Pandora's box once you, exactly. once you open it. And there's so, like, no you know, so many different kinds and it's, it's uh, fun. So I guess uh, a good question is, is this going to be the, the last bourbon novel you might ever write? Um, or you think, I don't know. Are you, you thinking about maybe how you can take it? Well, if this, this one really takes off, maybe I'll do a, a sequel, a sequel, <laughs> you know, the angel share aged double eight, double O <laughs> double or something. <laughs> double o. Um, I like it. But what I do plan on doing the, 
the bourbon in the angel share, my fictional bourbon is called old Sam. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've already done this with, with the next book I've finished. They drink old Sam. Um, so every book that I write from here on out, the characters are going to drink old Sam. So is an old Um, Sam a four year, a six year, what's the proof? (laughs) Well, (laughs) bottled and bond. That's what I'm going to, it's bottled and bond. Uh, I'm going to have to, uh, sit down and really think about it. I'm, I'm trying to remember what I put in there. I think they usually aged it four to six years. Um, it fits the description. Then. Yeah, there you exactly. Go. Right. So, <laughs> you know, but, you know, I plan to make old Sam, you know, live on through all the other books. I, I'm even tinkering with the idea of doing old Sam McPhee bourbon t-shirts, um, hats, whatever. It'd be neat if it was a real bourbon. <laughs> yeah, you know, if the book takes off be and popping on TTB, here's a, there yeah. you go. Yeah. It's just kind of, you would have to find aged bourbon and call it call it that because it's you know if I wanted to make my own bourbon now, then I just I have to sit on it for four to six nah, years. Just call MGP. We'll yeah, up. somebody won't, will fill up. Won't have any hair by then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go ahead. and We'll start wrapping this up. So anybody that wants to get the book, kind of, how do they get their hands on it, uh, and kind of what do you want to leave them with? Well. Um, you can get it anywhere. It's on Amazon. It's on all the ebook channels. Um, as far as local, um, the only store that's not carrying it, I think, is uh, Books a Million. Um, but Barnes and Noble has it. Um, I know the Barnes and Noble at the Summit has a ton of them. Carmichael's has a bunch. Uh, we just did a nice event with them last uh, Saturday at Third Turn Brewing. It was a good mm-hmm. time. We I think I sold about 100 books. And so anybody that's that's you know out there nationwide, make sure you do check it out on Amazon. It's called The Angel Share yeah. by the author James Marker. Right, and so. you should be able to get it at all the Barnes and Nobles across the country, and um, uh, especially in the South, a lot of the Southern in- independent stores uh, ordered a bunch. Awesome. So well, this is this is great because I think you are bringing a, a unique twist to this, right? Mm-hmm. Because you know the guests that that we always have on are the ones that are in the industry, right? The right. ones that are talking about the facts behind it, uh, and maybe some of the fiction behind it as right. well. But this is a true a true fictional novel that right. that takes the the best of you know the history that we have, and as you said, weaves them together to actually make a a good coherent story right. out of it. So so you know those are your experts, and I get to pretend to be an expert. <laughs> <laughs> That's what. Fiction Fiction is, I guess. You take the easy route. That's right. It. It's That's easy, right? Route, right? Yeah. <laughs> Don't work harder, work smarter. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so if you like what you hear, make sure you support the show on Patreon. That's P A T R E O N dot com slash Bourbon Pursuit. And follow us on those great social media channels Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Bourbon Pursuit. Yeah, James, thanks for taking the time. I'm fascinated by the story. I can't wait to dig in into this novel and uh, find more about the miracles and, yeah, you know, that, the angel share. So Thanks for having me. I, I can talk fiction and bourbon anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thanks again. And, and uh, to the listeners, if you have any show suggestions, feedback, comments, we love hearing from you. Um, we bring this content for you guys. So just let us know what you want to hear and we'll bring it to you. So we'll see you next time. This podcast of Bourbon Pursuit is in partnership with thewhiskeywash.com, a lifestyle website for news and reviews for people who like whiskey, and for those who think a life without whiskey has no style, thewhiskeywash.com.